How are you doing this afternoon? Very fine. Good. Great. Anybody sick? Did you know of?
especially in those areas where there's persecution. With wisdom and understanding and strength and mercy. Plus the leaders of Volgograd, of Russia, Ghana, United States, and other bunch of places where people are from, from Nigeria. I pray that each one will use the resources that you've given them wisely. Almost now as we look into your word, discuss uh, important uh, things that you will be able to help us to understand and apply things to the lives that we need. Thank you, Grace. Yesterday I, uh, I taught all day in a missionary school and uh, this week I was really working uh, a lot on, on preparing for that teaching and so I really didn't get to start, I, I had some ideas concerning my sermon, but I didn't really get to start writing the sermon until last night, and uh, this morning, and then, uh, so I basically skipped the sermon in transfiguration and finished my sermon for here. And right before the sermon, I mentioned to the uh, men in transfiguration that I was talking about the one to marry, and who you're supposed to marry. And uh, one of the guys said, well, you know, and this uh, Lutheran colony at, at an island at Sarepin. Sarepin? I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Sarepta. Sarepta. Okay. Uh, uh, I think about 100 years ago, there was a colony of Germans. Uh, they were believers, Lutherans, and um, they had an interesting way that people decided how they are uh, about uh, matching people. Uh, it, it was more a communal situation. Everybody lived together, and uh, they um, and uh, so all the children growing up in the community uh, they understood and they they knew each other. Okay. So how did it how, how did it happen? They didn't have dates. Um, what they did is once a year, everyone that had reached the qualification, the age, and it was able to and uh, I think it was, lead, I don't know for sure everything, but leaders in the church decided that, that these people were qualified to get married. Uh, the, the young man lived on one side, and the young woman lived on the other side of their big building and, uh, or area. And, uh, and uh, one day a year, uh, they, would, they would gather for a wedding. And what they would do is all the, all the guys that were prepared and and for wedding, they, they, would, they would have their names in a hat. And all the women that were prepared to get married, they had their names in the hat. And a child would come and they would pick a name of the guy, read his name, and then they would pick a name of the girl, and then they, they would get married. And I think they all married it the same day. You know, they, they, they would not, you know, stuff like that. How'd you like to do that? <laughs> uh, actually, you have to look at, at history, a lot of people, uh, got married not, not really knowing their future spouse before they got married. And they said there was no divorces in this, this Lutheran colony and uh, everything seemed to be going okay. I mean, people accepted that that's the way it should be. <laughs> but most of us uh, are not in that system, right? Uh, we're, we're looking in a different way. We're looking to each one choosing our future spouse. Uh, when I was looking at uh, who to marry, um, there was a number of qualifications that I was looking for. I was looking for a mature believer who was committed to serving the Lord in Russia, because the Lord, I knew, had called me to serve in Russia. Okay. That was one thing I was looking for. Um, since I love music, I was really looking for someone who also would enjoy this area of music. Um, it would be nice if they would speak English um, so that we could communicate a little better because I knew that if we get married, you know, they would have to go to the United States, we'd have to go to the United States, and, and this person, I don't know, is this live here, Peter? Okay. Um, this person would need to uh, speak English and stuff like that. And uh, actually, uh, and then there was one other thing. I wanted, I wanted someone 
not to be too young. Okay? Uh, I was already uh, in my mid-40s, and I didn't want a 20-year-old. Okay? So a 20-year-old could be my daughter. You know? Uh, I really did want somebody to be the, I want somebody closer to my age. Okay? And uh, when I looked at, when I thought about Olya, she was mature and uh, committed, and she was directing choirs and, uh, and uh, teaching in the Bible school, and, and, uh, and, uh, and she was only 11 years younger than me. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you look at somebody 11 years younger than you, you wouldn't want to marry them either. <laughs> But when you get to be uh, when you get to be 45, uh, uh, 35 doesn't look too bad, you know. So, like I mentioned in earlier times, we I, I asked her if she'd be interested in developing a relationship. She said, "Sure, why not?" Very enthusiastic about it, you know. And. Um, and, uh, and we began talking on the phone for a couple of weeks, uh, three weeks I think it was, before we were able to be alone together on our first date. And I, and I took on our first date, and uh, there was a pizza place right across the street there, it doesn't exist now, and I decided I'd take her to this pizza place. Now one of the problems is I'd never been to this pizza place before. And let me tell you, it's the worst pizza I ever had. <laughs> And Olya remembers the fact that they were smoking in there. She didn't like the place either. So, so after we ate the pizza, we went out walking on the on the on the um, uh, bank of the river there. And uh, as we walked together, we talked. And I and I thought about you know, what we should talk about. And I told to Olya, I don't see any reason why our, our relationship couldn't continue to develop. But it says I have three problems. Three problems that I cannot solve. In those three weeks, Olya had never expressed how she felt about me. You know? So I was kind of wondering, you know, how she had felt, how she felt about me in our relationship. Her response to us getting, uh, developing a relationship was, oh, I'm sure, why not? I mean, it wasn't like, yeah, that type of thing. Okay? And uh, the second thing is, uh, I know that she was taking care of her father. And I believe that it was, it was important that her father gave his approval. And also that I knew that we would, if we would get married, we would go to America and somebody would have to take care of her father. Okay? There's a problem I can't, I can't solve. I can't make his decision what he wants. And the third problem that I had <clears throat> related to my mission. I had a, a policy. You see, when you send missionaries out, you send missionary couples out. But if, you think, if the missionaries are single people and they get married, what, what's about the person if they're not a part of the mission? And the rule was uh, either you get married to someone within the mission or you have to leave the mission. And so I would have to have the approval of my mission leaders. What do we do? I, I told her about these three problems, and uh, we said goodbye, and she didn't respond, and she said, okay, uh, I understood this. And actually, she left for Moscow, and she had some education in Moscow for a couple of weeks, and I didn't see her for a couple of weeks. I had communicated with my leadership of the leadership on mission uh, about the situation. I had talked with my parents about things, uh, but we didn't really talk for two weeks. I think I got one letter from her, and that towards the end. And I met her on the train coming back, and I knew in my heart that she was the one. The Lord had given me peace before this, but those three problems remained. I thought she would tell me, I want to marry you. Then we would go to her father, and we'd talk about it, and then we would approach my mission. That, well, that's what I thought. But you know what? It happened exactly the opposite. Really. 
For the first time after she came down, I went back to, uh, we met and, and talked a little bit and, and for a couple of days, and then we went, then I went to Moscow to, uh, to uh, meet my boss. Now, it's the first time in four years he had come to visit me. And when I told him that there was a young lady that was interested in, he for sure was going to come and visit me. So I went to meet him, brought him down, and, and he met with Oya. And, uh, and there were some things that we, we talked about, you know, well, if we develop a relationship, we expect a good marriage, what would happen? And, and he said, well, um, you know, her English is not really that good. Um, by the way, a couple years before we started getting together, she had taken a two-year course in the university here on being a, an English a secretary, uh, English secretary. And it involved speaking English, and so she really did an intensive course in English learning, which really helped her uh, later on. But he said, well, she, you know, her English isn't really good, but she need to, you know, this was in, 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 um, in March, this is in March, uh, late February, March, and he said, you know, uh, yes, it would be good if she'd come to America for a few months and, uh, and she'd develop better English and then uh, she could um, maybe go to the candidate orientation in July and our mission and then we could get married. But it's a big problem. She was going, still going to her schooling in, the, in uh, being a choir director and her last session was in June. Okay, she couldn't go to America. She had to finish her education. She said, that doesn't work. And they said, well, they didn't have to wait a year. I said, that doesn't work either. I've been waiting for many, many years. <laughs> and I don't want to wait another year. And then basically they said, well, okay. We'll put you on provisional status. If you get married, then you have, within the next year, she either has to join the mission or you will leave the mission. So we've got our provisional permission from the, from the, from the mission. But Ole has never said if she wants to marry him. Okay? We're talking with him. She's there. We're talking about it. But she's never said, I want to marry him. Next step, I went to talk to her father. And as I mentioned, maybe, maybe earlier times, uh, we, he grilled me for two hours. He wanted to know where we would live and, and, and et cetera, and how, would, uh, how are things. He asked a lot of different questions. In the end, he said that, well, we'll have to call a family conference uh, to decide whether this was accept acceptable. And I said, please call the camp family conference, but the, the decision is yours. What he said to him. Papa, choose. Make a decision. He didn't like to make decisions, but he says, okay, I'll give you a mic. And I said, no, that doesn't cut it. I don't want your permission, I want your blessing. Okay? And so he said, where he put it, I give you Olya for your complete exploitation. <laughs> okay? After Olya, after Olya saw how God had worked in solving the problem concerning mission, and that her dad, who had said no to other men, said yes to me. She recognized this is from God. And she gave her love. And if you talk to her, you can say that her feelings for me developed over time. It wasn't a <clears throat> type of a thing. It was a developed over time. And I would say the same thing with me. My feelings develop over time for her. I think you can learn to love me. Now sometimes when you look at that, you say, well, I believe God brought us together. This brings us to the question that sometimes you face in life. 
Is there only one person in the world who you should marry? What if you miss that one person? You make bad decisions. And thinking about this and reading about this, um, I came across an article by Lisa Anderson in the Daily Manifesto, a drama fleet plan for, for pursuing marriage with a purpose. And she writes the following. The idea of the one is completely bogus. It's neither biblical nor practical. And it sets us up for one of two huge potential failures. If you're always looking for the one, thinking that there's only one person in this world that you could marry, you have uh, a problem with that. She has a problem with that, and I agree with her. She says, let me explain. On the one hand, waiting for the one leads to relationship paralysis. Because how can you be sure? You're waiting for that one to appear. And you don't know if this person is that one. If that girl is great, but so is this one, and so is that one, the one over there, how do you choose? Okay? Guys, you look over and you say, well, that's a nice girl. That's a nice girl. Who do I choose? What too many end up doing is not choosing at all. They wait and wait, and either for every possible fact and assurance, or for an unmistakable good feeling or sign. And if they're not satisfied with the, what they're seeing or feeling, they wait. They continue to search or church to dabble in relationship, or to hold on to a relationship, hoping they'll get the necessary confidence to move ahead. And it may never come. A lot of times, I think guys are this way, they, they, they become very passive. And guys, let me tell you something. That turns a girl off. That's so bad. Right, girls? Yeah. You know, just sitting there and doing nothing. You're wondering, when is this guy going to get off his rear end and get moving? <laughs> okay? Uh, what do I have to do? And, and maybe the guys, is this the one? Or not the one? Is this the one? And they end up being very passive and not active, and they stop become, they don't become the leader God wants them to be. Uh, you see, the reason Oli and I got married is because I took the initiative. I approached her and said, well, let's, let's try to start a relationship. And, and I took the initiative all through our relationship. On the other hand, here's another problem that you face if you believe in the one. Some fall in love and completely intoxicated by the overwhelming, overwhelming amazingness of who they fall in love with. They rush into marriage, certain they found the one. This is what I've been waiting for, and it doesn't get better than this. But, at the first bump in the road, that first unwelcome interruption to marital bliss, they pause. This should be happening. Why oh, isn't this? What isn't this? Why I made sure to marry my soulmate, and by marrying one's soulmate, uh, doesn't that practically guarantee a problem-free marriage? After all, this person should understand me. He or she should read my mind. But now we're fighting. We're seeing things we didn't see before. To be honest, I don't like this person at all right now. But did I make a mistake? Did I marry my wrong? My, did I really marry my soulmates at all? This isn't working. It's the only solution to start. The only solution is to start over. Because the one is out there somewhere, and I need to find him or her. And so they divorce and look for greener pastures. And the marriage becomes another casualty. Now, Lisa Anderson, uh, 
talks about him or her, and I think this can happen in both areas. But we I, I believe the second is more like a girl. She thought she found her prince charming, and all of a sudden he ended up to be uh, the beast rather than than the prince charming, and things don't go as well. And she says, maybe I missed the one. Maybe a guy too. Anderson goes on to state that the person you choose to marry becomes the one once you get married. Get that? Once you choose to be married, that person is the one. Or it is the one for me. Okay? Uh, and and if you think any way, uh, if, you, if you begin thinking in way others, you're, you're setting your marriage up to for failure. Okay? Once you get married, that person is the one that God has for you to be married. And your job, your job is to make it work with God's help. She says there's probably hundreds of people out there in the world that fit the qualifications as to who would make a good husband or wife for you. But that brings us back to our original question. In our first thing, she says that it's not biblical. Is she right in saying there's not one person the Lord wants you to marry? Does the Bible, what does the Bible say? And I'd like us to uh, example a uh, study what the Bible has to say. What are the about the biblical principles that a, a follower of Jesus should follow in, in choosing a, a helpmate, a marriage partner? And so let's let's talk about I'd like us to talk about different situations that occurred in scripture that talk about people getting married. And the most famous, you might say, the one of the most famous, or actually one of the first illustrations or descriptions of this is found in Genesis 24. We read of the process that led to Isaac and Rebekah getting married. Actually, Genesis 24 is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. And it's a marriage, you might say it's a love story, but it's, it's a marriage story. Uh, in a sense, Isaac has a very passive role. All he says is, yeah, that's the one. He agrees or uh, agrees uh, because it's his Abraham's servant that ends up choosing the wife for Isaac. Isaac just agrees to the choice. But as, as we go through this process, we, we see some very important principles that I believe are repeated in other parts of Scripture. The first principle that we read, uh, that we find here, is that believers should not marry unbelievers. I mean, if you're a believer, you should not marry somebody that's not a believer. Now, I want to stop just right here and say something. Uh, if, a per if two people are married when they're unbelievers, and one person becomes an unbeliever, becomes a believer, and I, I haven't talked about this in the sermon today, but the Apostle Paul very clearly says that just because you are a believer and that person is an unbeliever is not a reason to divorce. Okay? And he says, if it is all possible, seek to maintain this relationship. But you do not force the unbelieving person. If the unbelieving person decides they're going to leave, you can't force them to stay. Okay? So um, maybe we could talk about that other times, about how do, what do you do when you have um, a problems in marriage and stuff like that. But the Bible clearly says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? 
Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? If you're going and one person's going to light, other person's going to the darkness, you, you won't, you won't, you'll have conflicts. You're setting yourself up to a lot of pain and suffering. And Abraham recognized this. And he recognized that he lived in a society that was very wicked. Abraham himself was a godly man. But all you have to do is read the story about Sodom and Gomorrah, and you find out what kind of people that he lived, what, what his neighbors were like. Okay? They were not very good people. And when neighbor looked around and saw all these young women, he says, I don't want my son marrying one of these women. He believed that if Mary, Isaac married one of these women, it would be very bad for Isaac. God had called him to live in the land of Canaan. But these people were wicked, and they were so wicked that eventually... God would say, they need to be removed from this land. And he called the children of Israel to drive them out. And he forbade. God specifically said, you are not to marry anyone in the land of Canaan. He said, don't do it. If you do it, I'll kick you out of the company of Israel. In other words, you're to be excluded from Israel. Now, in the Bible, we have a couple examples of very, very clear examples of people who disobeyed God's direction. And when they disobeyed God's direction, they set themselves up for very great problems. One of these is Solomon. Although he was the wisest man ever he lived, uh, when it came to women, he became very stupid. Okay? And he, it says he married many foreign wives, and his wives led him away from the Lord. He built uh, temples and sacra altars so that they could worship their gods. And in the end, he ended up worshiping those gods too. And the result, God judged him and took the kingdom of Israel and split it in two. The north is called Israel, and the south is called Judah, when you read through the Bible. In the north tribe, on the north, all the kings that, that end up being in the north are, not call, are, called, uh, are called wicked. And one of the most wicked kings, his name was Ahab. Okay? Anybody know anybody named Ahab? <laughs> no. You don't know, you don't name your kids Ahab? Okay, okay, oh, because he was very wicked. How about Jezebel? Never know any ladies named Jezebel? Why? Because she is known for being a terrible woman. I think she was a very beautiful woman. But she tried to destroy the worship of God in Israel, killing the prophets of God. This is what happened when the king of Israel, who was supposed to worship God, married someone from outside of Israel. And she was from, from the country of Sidon, or Lebanon, which is to the north. Now, Abraham knew that if his son tried to marry one of these women, that they would not be good. And so we read in Genesis chapter 24 verses 1 through 8. Now Abram was very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. And he said to his senior, the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the God, the Lord, by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living. Now, putting his hand under the thigh was a way to ensure it's, it's just what they did. We put our hand on the Bible. They didn't have the Bible back then. That's what they did there. Okay? Uh, but go to my country and my own relatives to get a wife for my son Isaac. And the reason, uh, the reason they, he said go back there is because he was thinking that maybe there might be a godly woman there. Okay? Maybe there might be somebody, and my, my relatives maybe worship the true God. 
Uh, the servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I take, then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household in my native land, who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send you his, his angel before you, so that you can get a wife for my son from there. So Abraham, and if the woman is unwilling to come back to you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So, we got the situation. The servant is sent out to find a wife. Uh, but there's a problem. Now, if you were tasked to find a wife for somebody else, okay, what do you do? How is the servant supposed to choose the wife? Uh, he needed direction from the Lord. He was, a, he was a man that believed in God. And he worshipped God. And he prayed to God for direction. And so, as he is approaching the place uh, where El Abram's relatives would be, he, he prayed this prayer in Genesis 24-14. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, she sa and she says, drink and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that she has shown your kindness to my master. Now, first thing I want you to notice that the, that the servant was not looking for outward beauty. He didn't say, Lord, help me find the most beautiful girl around here. Now, the Bible does say that, Rachel, Rebecca was beautiful. But the servant was looking for inward character, and he knew that inward character is demonstrated by outward service. And uh, to give you an idea, they, they didn't have running water back there. Actually, the running, they had running water, but the running water was in she was running for the water. <laughs> they had a well. I uh, just said this is a pun here. Okay. So they had a well, and the the, water, the woman would would actually they would do it probably in the morning or the evening. Uh, they would come with their jar, go get the water from the jar, put the jar on their shoulder or on, on, on their head, and carry the water back into the into the uh, into the house uh, into the village where they lived. Okay. This was the job of the women back then, okay? And uh, you see this next, uh, several times in scripture that women often were at wells drawing water, okay? Remember, Jesus met the woman at the well in John chapter four, okay? This, this happened many, many times. I don't know uh, if, if uh, anyway. And, and what camels, can drink a little bit or a lot? A lot. Okay, he was since his desert land, and so and he had a number of camels, and so she had to go down, they would her steps down into the well. She had to fill her water jar up, carry the water jar up the well, into the trough so that the, the, to the uh, camels could drink. And she had to do this not just one time, maybe 10, 15, 20 times. Okay? So this servant was looking for what? A strong, hard-working woman. <laughs> okay? He said this. This is, this is good. And it's interesting that no sooner that he finished praying that God answered his prayer and Rebecca comes near and he asks her and she comes and she does exactly what he said. There's also to illustrate the principle. Inward godly character is more important than outward beauty. Guys, inward godly character is so much more important than outward beauty. The Bible, uh, and if you look through the Bible, you see another illustration about this. Uh, the story of Boaz and Ruth is another biblical example of this principle. Boaz was attracted to Ruth. Why? Because he saw her love for her mother-in-law. 
And also was the fact that she was working hard on the field. Proverbs says, charm, 31-30, charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. You see, a woman who fears the Lord will become more and more beautiful in their character as time goes on. Uh, as far as outward beauty, I hope I'm not telling you something you don't know, but people get wrinkles. Their hair turns color. Sometimes it falls out. Uh -huh. And uh, girls, if you want to know if uh, this guy's going to lose his hair, you know who you look for? <laughs> Not her father. Her, he has father, her, his mother's father. His mother's father. Baldness goes along the mother's line. Okay? So if his mother's father is bald, he'll probably become bald too. You know what? My grandpa on my dad's, my mom's side, was bald by the time he was 30. Okay. I made it a little bit further than that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's the way it is. Um, I, 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 on my, 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 uh, my grandfather on my dad's side, he had, he had hair till, uh, until he was uh, very, very old. So, just a, just a little hint of genetics. You all know your genetics, right? <laughs> Learn something from me, although I'm not a doctor. Okay, so. We recommend we focus on inward character, because inward character can develop all of our beauty will fail. And, uh, now it seems like if we look at the the the, um, the prayer of the servant, that he prays about the one God chose has chosen, and maybe he's implying that there was one person that God chose to be Isaac's wife, and and you might say God led him to Rebecca, but we must be careful. God doesn't lead his people, God does lead his people to make wise decisions. But he leaves the ultimate decisions to us. He does not force us. Okay? So God leads us in our choices. And, and this is brought out by the fact that after the servant describes to Rebecca's father and brother who he was and, and how the Lord had led him. The servant asks a question. Very important question. Genesis 24, 49. Now, if you will show me kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. If not, tell me. So that I may know which way to turn. In other words, he's saying, choose. This is what I believe God wants. But you have to make a decision to agree with it, too. I'll just add something here. There was a guy once that came up to Oli and said, God told me that he wants you to be my wife. <laughs> and you know what Oli's answer was? Well, when God tells me, then we'll develop a relationship. God never told her. <laughs> okay? Uh, people make choices. And um, he says, now, I've made my choice. I believe I have God leading in there. And how did they respond? Well, Genesis uh, 24, 50, 51. Laban and Bethuel answered. This was, his, uh, this was uh, Rebecca's uh, brother and father, and father. They answered, this is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or another. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go. Let her become the wife of your master's son as the Lord has directed. They recognized the hand of the Lord in this. And despite this, the, the, when the servant says he wanted to go with Rebecca, uh, 
they gave the last word to Rebecca herself. Uh, read in Genesis 24, 20, 57, 58. They said, let the young call, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. And so they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. Okay? So Rebecca eventually said, yes. I believe God does not force us to marry a certain person. He gives us the privilege of choosing and this act of choosing means there are alternatives and there are some consequences. So if I can choose, I can choose to marry this person and I can marry that person. But whatever choice I make, there are consequences, there are results. And I need to live with those results. Now, even if we follow God's leading in the one we choose, and God shows this, and and I have talked in other times about the way God reveals his will and God leads and guides. Remember, God leads, let's just repeat them real quickly. You remember, God leads through the Bible, okay, clear direction, but your but your names are not all in the Bible. Oh, some of your names are in the Bible. <laughs> okay, so if I can find Isaac here, and I put Isaac, then, then a girl can say, ah, Isaac is in the Bible, please. No, uh, There are principles in the Bible on who you should marry, but your name is in the Bible. Okay? God also leads through the, the counsel of God's uh, authorities in our lives. We went through Abraham and the servant. Okay? Your parents, a wise advice of godly leaders in your life. God works through his circumstances. God works through the calling of his peace. God gave me peace about oil and spirit. I also asked uh, leaders in the church what they thought about us being married. And, and they said that they, they were agreement that this was this was good. And uh, but also God sometimes works through dreams and visions and things like that. But God does not force. There's consequences. Uh, but even if we marry the person God has has uh, has led us to marry, this doesn't mean there won't be problems. We're all sinners in need of daily help from the Lord. And Isaac and Rebecca have their problems. Their conflicts. They have twins. And Rebecca liked Jacob. Esau, I, Isaac liked Esau. Each had their favorite son. And this got problems. God had revealed to, to Rebecca something about um, what the future was. But because of the differences and agreements between a Rebecca and Isaac, uh, I believe this followed through on their children. And their children also made some bad choices. Esau made some bad choices in, in who he chose to marry. He married some of the women of the land, and they became, it says in the scripture, they became... Big heartache for Rebecca. They cause all kinds of problems. Two of them, he married. And if we think about Jacob, you know, the schemer, and his family, was Jacob's family a model family? Uh, he, married, he married four women. He liked one better, and there was just conflict within them. I think this probably ended up because there's, we're all sinners. And we all need God's grace in our lives. In saying this, I want to note two other marriages in Scripture. The marriage of Ruth and Boaz. The life of Ruth illustrates a very important principle that God can bring blessing, great blessings, even to those who make poor marriage decisions early in their life. Ruth had been married to a man that God said you shouldn't be married to. Actually, it was a man that wasn't supposed to marry her. Okay? We don't know if Ruth had any say in her first marriage. Okay? 
but her, her first husband died. But she had a choice. Uh, she, could, she, could, she could choose to do what is good and right, but she chose to love God, and she chose to love others. And the result, God led her to make wise decisions in the future. So despite what we've chosen in the past, if we choose right now to love God and love others, God will bless us to make wise decisions and help us and others to make wise decisions as well. And we won't go into the whole story of Ruth. You can read it in the Bible. Okay? You might say it's a love story, but the real love is between a, a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law, not a husband and wife. Although I'm sure Mom Boaz uh, loved Ruth and Ruth loved Boaz, but it really doesn't talk about that. Another marriage that is mentioned in the Bible is the marriage of Esther. You might say on one side, she had no choice in who she, she would marry. She was probably taken forcibly to possibly be a one-night distraction for a king. He was unselfish, he was a selfish believer, unbeliever, who seemed to have absolute power. Okay? So what do you do when you're forced into a marriage that you don't want? This is Esther. You see, we cannot make choices for others. We cannot choose how people treat us. But we can choose how we treat them. We can respond in a godly way to those who make bad decisions. And when we do that, we're saying we believe God's in control. While the, it was the king's choice to choose to marry, marry Esther, actually he married her because she had made some great, good choices after she was forcibly taken. Okay? She demonstrated godly character, and her godly character made everybody else, the people in charge, really like her. And so they said, well, we want Esther to become queen, and uh, they did everything they could to help her. And she had wisdom to submit to their advice. She became queen. But we never read about her personal relationship with the king. You know, he, he would offer things and do things, but I mean, it says in, uh, I don't remember the, the, the number, but in Esther, the reading in Esther, that he married her. But, by the way, he had thousands of women he could sleep with if he wanted to. That was the time back then. But when, when Esther is made queen, she says, um, um, she, said, she says this, and I'm going to look at it here. Um, she hadn't been with the king for 30 days. Okay? This tells me either that king was very busy or he was busy with somebody else. Okay? And uh, so we don't know about her relationship with the king, queen. And she didn't know either. But she believed God was in control. It's doubtful that this king ever became a believer. But because Esther made some wise decision, she was able to, uh, to make some good choices in life. Mordecai challenged her in this sense. If you remain silent at this time, Esther 4.14, in relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but if you and your but you and your family will perish, and who knows what that you have come uh, uh, that 
you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And, and for those of you who don't know, uh, there was a, a threat against the slaughter all the Jews, and Je uh, Esther was a Jew, and she could try to speak up and save her people. And she was afraid if she spoke up and saved her people, then she would die. And Mordecai says, you need to do the right thing. Because God will do what he, want, he wants. If you don't do the right thing, somebody else will do the right thing. But you will perish. Okay? So if, I, think, I believe this brings us to a, a principle too, you know. If, if somebody, you think God is leading you to marry somebody, and that person says no. What do, they, what do you do? Well, you find somebody else. Okay? It's just like an Esther. It said, if, 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 you, if that person doesn't have the wisdom to understand God's leading, or God doesn't lead to, then there is somebody else that God is going to raise up. Okay? So don't despair. If that person you think you should marry doesn't want to even look at you, there will be somebody else. Better. Okay? Better. But you need to do what is right. We, when we choose to do what is right, no matter who our life partner may be, we can have a great impact for the kingdom of God. So we never know if if Esther ever had a great love life, a great marriage, but we know that she saved her people. Okay? So we don't know, I don't know what's going to happen in your lives. I don't know if you're going to have great marriages or not, but I know that you can have a great impact for God and His kingdom, no matter what. And by the way, marriages are temporary. They last only as long as you live. Work for God's kingdom will last for eternity. You work for eternity. You don't just work for the temple. Now, last Sunday we talked about the three uh, dating level three, uh, dating with the future in view. And you remember that it focuses on official relationship and how it might develop into something permanent. You ask this person if, if, if this third person should become your best friend. By the way, this last week, uh, Lily said, you know, have, uh, ask me about my friends. Have, do you have a good friend, best friend? I don't know if I have a good friend. And, and she listed some qualifications of who could be a friend of hers. And, uh, and uh, one of them was not telling secrets, uh, my secrets. Uh, anyways, I don't remember the other two. But anyways, uh, this is what she said. And, but I said, Oli is my best friend. Okay, she has become my best friend. And your, your husband or wife should become your best friend. You seek to discover if this person is someone you want to marry. At level three, you, uh, you have one or two dates a week and you have multiple contacts. As you move into stage three, from stage two, you appreciate the person so much you're willing to de deny yourself in order to preserve a friendship. You put their needs ahead of yours. You desire for the person to become everything God wants him or her to become. You know, whenever I, I prepare a sermon, you know what happens? God always tests me a lot of times in this. So I was sitting there last night preparing the sermon, and Olya comes in, and she had to talk. She had some things she was just she had been researching and some she wanted to share what, what she had learned. So I had to set the sermon aside and said, okay, I need, I need to listen to you. Okay? And this morning, uh, okay, I, I got up about 5, 5.30 to get to, to work on my sermon again. And uh, I'm working there on my sermon, and then all of a sudden I hear this cry. All these problems, I have to leave the sermon aside, and I need to go, and I need to take care of it. Okay? So that's what you do. You say, I will put aside my needs in order for this relationship. Now, at the end of stage three, 
You should have a healthy, appropriate intimacy. You should have clarity about your feelings. You should have enough knowledge about the other person to give you confidence concerning future decisions. You should be familiar with family issues, both good and bad, okay? You should know about his, his or her parents, maybe uncles and cousins and aunts or, or grandpas and grandmas. You should not know about them, uh, good and bad. You should understand your strengths and weaknesses because you need to see to fit it together where her strengths would help your weakness and, and vice versa, etc. You should have a deeper love and respect for each other and for God. And you need to not only spend time with each other's families alone, but with his families, friends, co-workers, and acquaintances. And you need to know how others have influenced your partner and what you need to guard against. Now, some good things or bad things are noticed about the parents. And we talked about this last week. And what, what follows in, in the printed sermon is basically a lot of things that I, I mentioned last week. We're not going to talk about them in depth this week, but because we didn't have groups last week, uh, Uncle Sam said we need to talk about these things. So I've listed some of the things. If you don't have last week's sermon, I don't know if there's some more copies back there to get your mind. I listed some of the questions that you need to ask uh, in this area. And we'll just talk about the questions we won't describe them. How have you grown spiritually, individually, as a couple since dating? How strong is your attraction to this person now compared to your initial attraction? Your attraction spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Is your truth triangle in balance? And we talked about that last week. Does this person appear to be con uh, consistently stable emotionally? Are they up one time and down another? Does your, do your friends like this person? Does this person respect the physical boundaries of the dating levels? Okay, and uh, and then uh, then I list there some of the the physical boundaries uh, of bonding that might happen on the level three, and said that probably should happen on level four. Uh, and some people wait for marriage for some of these things to happen: kissing hand to head, touching of hand, and touching hand in the body, not the private parts. Each person, I remind you, responds to different physical contact. The physical contact that causes uncontrollable sexual tension is inappropriate. For some, these actions are so stimulating that they cannot keep their true triangle in balance. And they need to be reserved for some engagement or even after the wedding. Um, and sometimes the physical takes over. I've listed in... Uh, um, Chuck Millen um, uh, lists uh, in this area five sexual time bombs. Okay, uh, what's a sexual time bomb? It's a, it's a, if you are involved in this, you uh, you can. It's very hard. It can be very difficult for you to to maintain your true triangle and keep yourself pure spirit uh, physically. Late night talking. If you're sitting together talking late at night, it's very easy uh, to go further. And maybe talk on the phone, okay? That way you aren't there wanting to really uh, get involved, okay? If you're sitting on the couch or in the, you'll see in the movies in America, they sit in the back of the seat of the car or something and, and start cuddling and, and stuff like that uh, or knocking, uh, kissing a lot, uh, what happens is that conversation is stopped and it can, it can, it can uh, snowball from there. It can... Uh, Kind of open there. Back rub, okay, you're rubbing the person's back. That feels good. And pretty soon it goes some other places that need to be rubbed too. And you have to be careful in that, okay? Um, the belief that no accountability is needed. 
we're Papa adults and we can take care of ourselves. Uh, we need to listen to the advice of others. Now sometimes if you're in a relationship, you there's people that you need to say, okay. Uh, this is what's happening, and you would report to the other person and help you keep a calm cool. Nothing. Okay. It's just sleeping on the couch, okay? Oh, uh, you're talking late at night. Oh, he, she's going to her bedroom, and, and he's just going to sleep on the couch that night. Okay, well, that can be it can very, very much snowball into somebody else sleeping on the couch with you, or uh, somebody coming into the bedroom. Okay, so be aware of those time bombs. Uh, Satan can put thoughts in your mind, be like Joseph, and flee, okay? Uh, the Bible says, uh, and I, I, I didn't write this down, Paul says, flee youthful, youthful lusts. If you can't control yourself, get out of there, okay? Cool down, and, and things will be better. It's my prayer that God will help each one of us make wise choices to become the loving people He wants us to be. And I'm going to leave it there, and we'll talk more about some of these choices later on as we go. Let's put on a word of prayer together. Thank you, Father, that you love us. You do lead and guide us in our love relationships. Thank you, you've led Boy and me together. Thank you that uh, even when we make mistakes, you pour your grace out in our lives, and you give us ways to serve you and honor you. I pray that you'll keep people, each one here, pure. First of all, keep each one pure in their thought life. Help us to think with to, of each other in ways that are honoring and glorifying to you. I pray that you help us in our relationships with each other. Not only to think properly, but to act properly. I pray that you'll help the guys here to take the initiative that you want them to take. I pray that you'll help the girls here, the women here, to respond properly to the different things. And not to try to manipulate. I pray that you'll, Father, you'll lead and guide so that the relationships that have developed because of people being together here, will be honoring and glorifying to you, glorifying to you. Thank you that you love us, and thank you that we walk with you and serve you and experience your joy and your love and uh, through through each other. Thank you for your mercy, Lord, and your grace. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. I have a number of questions that we'd like you to ask and uh, talk about that how do you can develop a right kind of love, why a person should spend time with family, the one she's dating, you're dating. Uh, you might want to discuss what questions a person want to ask. Maybe there's some questions that I did not list, okay? And uh, what choices you should keep in mind uh, when you make decisions concerning, or I, sh I should say, what principles you should keep in mind. I, that's a wrong word, not choices. But principles you should keep in mind when you make decisions concerning your life. Okay? Lord bless you, and let's, uh, let's have a time where we can praise the Lord and give our tithes and offerings. Okay?